Not yet. Hey, folks, we're just waiting for the this cameras to roll. Good evening, Rolling Meadows. This is April Committee of the Whole Meeting for April 17, 2018. Mr. Crumstock, I believe you are going to lead off the, uh, the evening with the recycling contract renewal. I'm doing uh, brief introductions before I bring in Public Works Director Fred Vogt, who will actually then turn it over to some of the folks from Advanced Recycling and Refuse and everything else. Um, but we do want to bring this one back because obviously when we had the last cow, we were asked um, twofold to go back and have a discussion with Advanced Disposal, our current provider since 2013, um, and then also to prepare an RFP. But at this point in time, what we're bringing back um, is that proposal that we feel comfortable with, and it does have parameters within uh, 3% and 5%. Um, it would be a longer term that we felt comfortable with um, for recycling. And with that, obviously with the write-up, um, we have additional information and I know that uh, at least one alderman appreciated all the uh, insights on recycling in China that we actually provided with that too, um, which was most of the packet this time too. But uh, at that point in time, um, I will turn this over to uh, Public Works Director Fred Vogt to go over some of the pieces, and we do have some additional information. Thank you, Barry, and thank you, Mayor and Committee. Um, I will not discuss the attachment, um, <laughs> unless anybody's got thank questions you, on it that Brett. we can research. We'll stick to the uh, business items. Uh, and point out uh, some things in our recent discussions over the last several weeks with advanced disposal. Um, we have negotiated with them for a couple of months now, back and forth, have had several meetings with them. Um, what we put in the um, cover page of the staff summary is a comparison small chart <coughs> regarding what our current contract is this year what we, that we pay three dollars ninety one cents per month and that's in, included with the uh, monthly utility bill and for refuse collection yard waste collection is all added together that if we were as council uh, directed um, last month when we discussed this to continue the current contract and add either 3% or 5% uh, CPI. The range there, you know, next year would be $4.02 at the higher rate, $4.11 carried out. It's the third year of either $4.26 roughly or $4.54. Um, advanced uh, best offer to us as they presented to us a, about two weeks ago is to go to $4.50 for the first year, which would be July 1st, 2018 to June 30th, 2019. And then the CPI at the same terms as uh, what we currently have would um, be eligible to kick in. So roughly it's about 40 to 50 cents per month more than what the current expiring contract uh, reflects. Now there's several things that uh, we want to point out to City Council, one of them that's not even here, that uh, um, their staff and Chris Manley and Trish Tish Powell are here from Advance to, to answer any questions that uh, the Council may have or to say a few words when I'm done. But uh, we had talked a few times about carts that um, are recycling carts that the City bought in 2008 are at the end of their 10-year warranty. Um, we will be faced with having to take on those replacement costs, repair costs um, after this year. Um, Advanced has indicated that uh, given that they typically have a surplus of carts that they may um, be able to negotiate with us and arrange for some terms that uh, we could uh, utilize their services to replace carts um, if we continue a contract with them for um, the recycling services. So that wasn't there because it's really not well able to be defined, but um, is something that they've offered to us during uh, some of our negotiation discussions. Um, we have reached out and had several discussions with the Solid Waste Agency of Northern Cook County. Um, we did get a sample contract for them three years ago when the last community within the Swank Agency um, put out proposals for just recycling services as opposed to 
refuse yard waste recycling services and uh, that came in at about four dollars a month their um, executive director indicated that he would expect to see if we were to go out for proposals that we would probably be in that four dollars to four dollars 75 cents per home monthly range um, also point out given that we changed vendors five and a half six years ago um, there certainly is a value to be had by retaining a contractor Staff can't really t tell you what that value is, but uh, the changeover did come with some pain when we um, when we did it uh, in terms of learning curves. Our service with Advanced over the last five and a half years has been very good once they pass that initial learning curve. Um, and our complaints for missed pickups or other problems is uh, are very few. Um, it's been good service. We do, if council chooses to um, direct staff, we have um, requests for proposals uh, about 90% done. Um, I would expect to be able to get those out in the next week um, if, we, if we need to do so. We utilize the um, proposal request uh, format from five, six years ago to put that together if staff desires us to do that. Um, we talked about waste swapping, the program that we started about two years ago with Advanced as they operate the transfer station on Burdnick Street, uh, which has little to do with, if nothing to do with the recycling services collected. And we decided that because it really doesn't have anything to do directly with recycling, uh, to separate that issue out, we will continue discussions with Advanced in regard to um, costs that they see that they're incurring and um, want to pass on to the city at, uh, at some point in time for that, given that we are saving the wear and tear on our trucks. We're saving the time from not having to go to the um, Glenview facility, but rather utilizing their facility, the transfer station that they have on Burdnick Street. So for discussion purposes, for considering a recycling contract, we think that's not germane to the um, overall recycling consideration. Um, the article that uh, you have as attachment, um, amongst other things that it points out, the market has changed significantly with recycling. We don't see the um, opportunities currently for rebate programs and other incentives that we saw several years ago. We don't know what's going to happen in the future with the market. The article kind of points out a few things that uh, may happen, but the market is much different than it was several years ago, and that's one of the reasons we see costs increase on behalf of um, proposals. Again, it's about a 50% per month cost. Um, we have not looked at, uh, from the standpoint of impacts to the refuse fund and what that would ultimately do. We certainly could do that, but uh, just the raw numbers based on the proposal we have for a three-year contract extension uh, carry that uh, with it. When we, or if we would go out for proposals, we could see better numbers. We could see numbers that are uh, slightly higher than that. We really don't know. So we feel that advanced disposal is likely with their proposal close to what, uh, and in the ballpark in terms of what we would see if we uh, get proposals. But um, that's where staff is at this point in terms of uh, going forward with a contract extension or to uh, go out onto the market. So if there's any questions, be happy to answer them. Or I don't know if you want to say anything, Tish, or certainly your opportunity. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. My name is Tish Powell. I am the Municipal Marketing Manager with Advanced Disposal. I'm joined here today by Chris, with Chris Manley, our General Manager for our Chicago North Division, which we proudly service your, your community. Um, here to answer any questions and um, hopefully um, get some feedback from you on, on our proposal. Okay, I guess we're gonna start off with questions of clarification from what was provided in the pack, packet. Mr. Manager. Thank you. Um, Tish, the only question I would have, and the way Fred uh, posed this comment was it's just in the exploratory stage, but carts, I was amazed when I got on council to find out how much carts were. Um, so if so, that's actually kind of a big deal. If we're at the end of their useful life and they're going to do a wholesale uh, renewal, which we probably should do if we're going to be nickel and dimed with 
repair costs. Um, how far have we gotten in terms of a, a cart replacement? Are we, we just starting to talk about those? We were just starting to talk about that because we do still have this spring as the last opportunity and we're currently going through an inventorying cart conditions and replacements. We will turn in one more uh, warranty order, but uh, once that is completed this summer, then we're on our own. So we haven't really gotten into that too far yet in terms of replacement. We do have some spares, but certainly over the course of the next two, three years or more, um, we'll be needing to look at that and how that would impact the budget uh, if we replace them as needed and uh, bought spares or at some point in time, given that they're already 10 years old, a wholesale replacement. Or it may be something that at some point in the future could even be a uh, negotiating factor in a uh, re recycling contract or ex extension. All right, thank you. And I, I, if I can just add, um, in. Fred mentioned this a little bit. Um, that is something that we are wholly um, committed to to do as part of this longer term contract extension. That we understand that that is a um, that could be a significant cost for the village um, over time. Um, looking at replacing carts, so we are are certainly willing to replace and repair carts as needed um, during the course of that of our agreement. Thank you, Ms. Majekis. Thank you. Um, and I'm, I know it says here our current contract that was done in 2012 provided for an annual three to five of uh, three to five percent price increase. Um, and if you don't know this, that's okay. I guess I could have checked my history of my bills, um, but I saw this. Have we seen an increase every single year since 2012? Do you know? Yes, it's typically been based on CPI. Right. So it has gone up yes. every single year. Okay, 3%. just I figured it had. I just wanted to see. Okay, which is is pretty pretty standard. Okay. okay. Mr. Thank Mr. Cannon, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I was wondering, Fred, could you give us an idea how many carts a year we've been replacing? Just an average, just ballpark. I know you don't have the exact stats, but are we doing fifty, a hundred, five hundred? I don't have any idea how many we're replacing. It started low, obviously, because they were new, but. Um, I believe it's at least in recent years a uh, couple hundred or several several hundred per year. So right now, if I remember right, we're paying about seventy-five bucks a cart, or that's what we projected to be, or is it more than that even? Um, my recollection was that the carts cost forty-five, fifty-five dollars back ten years ago. So you may have a better idea than we do at this point as to what the they're about the same. About, the same. about forty-five, fifty dollars, fifty-five dollars per cart. Because okay, there's remember. two different sizes. Yeah, we have different sizes because some people didn't want the right, larger the size because yeah. it didn't fit in their garage. Okay. The other question I was going to ask, could you just give me an idea? You know, I know the recycling business has gotten really difficult. What do you do with the things you recycle now? Is there a market at all for all of it? Like for the paper and the metal? Does it go somewhere or where does it go to the dump? No, we do not send it to the dump. Um, I don't. We don't want to end up on the news. Um, <laughs> so um, yes, and, and part of the articles that were provided with your packet really just talk about um, the fact that China, remarkably, um, has been the largest consumer of single stream recycling that comes from the United States. And as a result of some of their recent laws that were passed, they put some very tight restrictions on incoming recyclables into their country. And as a result of those restrictions, um, they've um, really tightened up um, the amount of contamination, as in like garbage that's mixed in with the recycling, that is allowed to come in. Um, and they've set that amount at about 0.5%, which is really almost impossible to get to. Um, if you look at some of the material recovery facilities in the Chicago area and even in the United States, probably at best, after all of the sorting manually and with um, blowers and, and all of the machinery, they could probably get down to maybe about 5%. Um, so that 0.5% is, is a major problem. Um, things have actually been shipped over and have, have started coming back. Um, so right now, where things stand, really uh, looking at other markets, other international markets to take material. Um, some domestic markets are starting to open up, but that's going to take a lot more time. Um, so one of the things that we will be doing as a company um, is, is obviously working with all of our municipal customers to really um, 
re-educate our residents on what is and is not recyclable in our programs. Because uh, I think a lot of people really want to do the right thing, but a lot of times um, put the wrong thing in the recycling bin, which really just adds to that problem. So like, so I assume what you're talking about mostly is metal going over to China, right? Actually, no. It's, it's a lot of paper. A lot of paper and plastic. And the, and the paper is what is really causing a lot of the problem because in the single stream recycling programs, even though the carts are great, it gives people more capacity, it encourages folks to recycle more, the fact that we're mixing paper in with uh, glass and metal, when it goes in, that, in, in the trucks and it gets compacted, what happens to the glass? It breaks and it ends up getting um, mixed in with the paper. And that is one of those contaminants that are a problem for China and many other markets to process that material. And Alderman Cannon, actually, Tish told us a story about there's a vendor in the state of Illinois um, out of business now, but uh, the state actually asked them to uh, pick up part of it. And the bales are still there, and you can see everything mixed um, all together, and I can't remember where it was, but uh, I can't either. But again, that's now you got this product that's just sitting there, um, and it can't be recycled because you got all the contaminants, if you want to call it. Okay. Well, I really appreciate uh, you folks coming out and talking to us tonight. Uh, but that said, I would really think because of the price increase that we're looking at, I think as a city, we're almost forced to have to go out and just take a look and see what all, what the marketplace is offering. Uh, I appreciate the numbers you've thrown at us, but I would just like to get them confirmed by some competition. Understandable. And one of the things that I know that we've discussed with staff is um, I know that um, as a Swank community, um, one of they had a, a sheet of, a couple of years ago looking at pricing for just on the recycling side of, of what the pricing was. And I think it was closer to 6 or $7 is, is what I saw um, for curbside recycling. Um, and the 450 that we were coming in um, at, I thought, was was very competitive compared to um, what they were seeing in the area. I mean, obviously, we would we um, value your business. We'd love to continue uh, to work with you, um, and, and we think we we provided a competitive proposal. Okay, I guess the other thing I would like to just ask is if if we could convince the apartment complexes in our town to get the recycling picked up by you, would that would that help at all on pricing? You're looking at p potentially franchising your commercial um, apartment complexes? We, we've had a discussion. It's not going real far yet, but I think we all would. It's something I think a lot of us would like to see happen. We're, we're certainly open to looking at that, uh, definitely. Would it possibly change the price? It, it would be a lot, um, probably a lot more interesting to us if it was garbage and recycling than just the recycling. Okay. Thank you for your comments. Appreciate it. Sure. Uh, Mr. Bud Metz. Um, question. <clears throat> um, the 3% and 5% CPI, are these, are you going to charge us the actual CPI or 3% or 5%? Where, where does that come from? Because I'm looking at the CPI from since your contract inception, and I'm looking at um, year over year averages increases of 1.5, 0.8%, 0.7%, 2.1%, 2 and 2.1%. So are we going to anticipate the actual CPI or, or, or a larger number? Uh, good question. Um, the way we were looking at doing the price increase is because the CPI has really not kept up with what our actual cost increases have been. And as you know, as a city, your largest driver of cost is, is labor. Um, we all have unionized labor and there are uh, built-in adjustments in all of their, their labor contracts, which are closer to at least 25 to 3% a year. So um, based on um, the CPI adjustment that we were seeking in this agreement would be based on CPI with a minimum 3% maximum five percent but it's all it's based on what the cpi is but at least to get a minimum three percent and 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 we could look we could relook at that if that's a problem okay and your, your um, proposal also said something about if you anticipated costs of um, fuel going up but since the since you signed the contract the average diesel price has actually gone down about a dollar a gallon so since 2012 so 
I guess the question is, is what base is that going to be on? The 2012 base or the 2000 or, or to current base? It would it would be on probably moving forward the base where we are right now. Um, but typically, unless things really get bad with the, the fuel prices, we don't generally come back to municipalities. One of the the primary uh, goal with that clause is the change in law clause. For example, the big change in law that obviously affects, um, that has affected the solid waste industry over the past couple of years is the change in um, electronics recycling. That has had a major impact on um, operations or if you go back a, more than a couple of decades, the change in requiring that yard waste no longer be landfilled. Those are the types of change in law that are major that we would um, obviously come back to the city and, and want to and need to renegotiate some pricing on. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gell, sir, Alderman Gell. Um, you mentioned that um, if we were to go out looking for potential bids from other vendors, that the going market rate is around seven dollars. Um, how is it that you're able to provide this price to us versus that without getting into any sensitive information? But how can you provide such a lower price? Because we like you a lot. <laughs> That's what but, I thought. but besides, but besides that, um, obviously we 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 do have the equipment. We have the um, we have the equipment. We have have the labor um, already here providing the service to you, and uh, we do value the partnership. As Fred mentioned, we um, operate your transfer station and uh, can currently work with you on a swap agreement um, to to help your internal operations be more effective um, in terms of your solid waste collection. Um, so. We, we did, you know, look at all of that and uh, definitely wanted to provide you with the most competitive pricing that we could. Thank you. Any other questions for clarification? Um, so then, um, I guess we'll open it up for discussion. Any questions on discussion? Mr. Crumstock? No, we're just looking for, again, the question would be stay or... As we said, the RFP is ready to go. So, if there's no discussion, the, the we'll uh, we'll call the question of should we stay or should we go out to bid. All in favor of staying, please raise your hand. Uh, to all opposed, I mean all for going out to bid. Three. We don't have. Just good hygiene. We don't. We normally do with four for the majority there. Um, and since we're missing two members at the moment, we could, the, trouble, the, the challenge is if we wait another month to go out to bid, we're running into the end of our contract, correct? That is correct. And also what we, and obviously um, advanced knows if it is out to bid, um, some of their numbers are out there at this point in time. But again, um, you can always ask for bids, and then you, you see what the numbers come back at. Well, based on that, I believe that the direction of the council is to go out for bid. And when they come back, we can uh, hopefully have a fuller uh, council and make a decision at that time. So that's direction from staff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And just to clarify, we have requests for proposals going out, so yes. it's not a formal bid process, right. uh, but uh, nice. but proposals. And we'll actually talk more about bidding and proposals later in the evening. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ken. Uh, Fred, can I ask you one other question too? Could, since we brought up the issue about carts, could we I, could we address that? Just keep on going. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. Could we? Could I guess? Could we get a definitive answer from Advance and anybody else we get a bid from as to what they will do with carts with us? So we at least have an idea of what cost factors we're looking at there? Sorry. Yeah, we can put that in as one of the questions. Great. Thank it's you. It's appropriate it. to add to the um, document that we have, but we will uh, Great. Thank you. add that to it. Sorry. I'm sorry for interrupting you, Mr. Cannon. Sorry. Uh, 
thank you. We're, we're done with this one. Uh, I know there are many people here tonight that are coming up for the next uh, item on the agenda, which is going to be chickens. We're going to move chickens from number five to number two because we do have someone who has signed in. So, did you sign in yourself, Andrew? So, did you sign in yourself? So, uh, Mr. Comstock, would you like to give us the uh, the chicken dance? No. <laughs> um, obviously, it's been some time since we had a backyard chicken discussion. It is back again. Um, what I would leave it to that um, again. It does take four votes, and with that, I will. Obviously, Alderman Banjer knows that anytime I see articles about chickens, I've been sending them to him, too. Um, there are municipalities that do have backyard chickens. They've changed some of their um, yard requirements and some of their other pieces. But again, as mentioned in the uh, write-up, um, again, these are free-range um, chickens, so they're not typically backyard ones. But with that, I would turn it over to Alderman Banjer. Thank you. Um, uh, those of you who were here on, in 2014, that's the last time we talked about uh, backyard chickens, um, and that was the uh, birds and the bees write-up. And uh, bees advanced out of committee, chickens got shot down. Um, I, I think the final nail in the coffin was when Chief Scanlon came up and, uh, and said he didn't want his uh, police uh, fellows uh, chasing chickens. Um, although, although at the time he had mentioned roosters, and as you can clearly see in this write-up, that's not a part of this uh, 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 of, of my proposal. Um, this is something since 2014 uh, that has caught on uh, with a lot more suburbs. Uh, several of our neighbors since then, uh, St. Charles being the uh, the latest one, I, th I think uh, Bartlett also um, was in the newspaper recently uh, with their backyard chickens. Bartlett was in the uh, news recently because they dropped the minimum lot requirement. Uh, some people fell just a few square feet shy of the minimum lot for backyard chickens. Um, Bartlett uh, reviewed it. They said, you know what, what the important thing here is side yard setbacks, not the actual, you know, size of the yard. So let's just stick to the side yard setbacks and not worry about the lot size. I've uh, added in my uh, write-up, I'm I don't think it'd be fair to deny people just just because they have a smaller house. These are these are oh, it's only going to be four chickens anyway under my proposal. Um, and uh, the other part of my uh, write up is basically punching holes in any of the in, in any of the uh, folks who have the negative aspects of uh, backyard chickens. Um, I, I somebody sent me a uh, a write up titled The Dark Side of Backyard Chickens, which which essentially said they attract uh, monkey wolves and, and mountain lions, but uh, so do dogs and cats. So I don't think that's uh, valid. Um, chickens smell, they don't. Chickens are noisy, they're not when you exclude roosters. Um, uh, they're not vectors for disease. Uh, the big chicken operations may be, but when you have four chickens in your backyard, they're not. Um, uh, the the uh, write-up I read also started talking about the uh, the costs of uh, chicken coops, and that's something that the residents c can deal with. Um, and I, I don't imagine you'd want to pour several thousand dollars into something when you're buying sixteen dollars worth of chicks. So, so I don't think that's a a, a valid uh, complaint. Um, this is something that I'm kind of passionate about, just because I, uh, along with bees, I just think it's weird that you, we can't do things that that, in my opinion, we should be able to do. So. So I've been pulling these things out of our uh, city ordinance that says no farm animals. Bees aren't a farm animal, and I and I think they're both good for the environment, and, and anybody should be able to run a beehive in their backyard if they want to. And I had tried initially, and I'm trying again, to get ch chickens uh, ch taken out of that prohibition in the ordinance and, and uh, into, into residents' backyards. Uh, what I'd be asking tonight is uh, do me... My ask would be pass this out of committee so we can at least get uh, a, a an ordinance uh, in front of all seven members, uh, and then and then aldermen can vote it up or down as they wish. Um, 
I have s several people that have reached out and and the ones they've reached out to aren't with us tonight. So uh, I think to be fair, I would I would ask for this to move out of committee so we can get working on uh, on an ordinance and let those people be heard. This I think would be exactly like backyard beekeeping, uh, much ado about nothing. After after year one of backyard beekeeping, uh, there were six beehives uh, in the city of Rolling Meadows uh, with, with one beekeeper. Uh, starting this year, there's gonna be three beekeepers, uh, to my knowledge, and, and six beehives in various locations throughout the city. So I think this is one of those things, uh, and, it, and uh, in a recent article about Evanston, it, it, it was much ado about nothing. They had a you know passionate back and forth about it, and then at the end of year one, there were seven total permits in a suburb of seventy thousand people. So, um, again, I would just ask uh, if you have read the write up, uh, get it out of committee. Let me bring it back in the form of an ordinance. Uh, if you have any suggestions, if you have any amendments, uh, tell me now, and then I can I can take those into considerations when we craft the ordinance to bring back to the full council. So if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. Um, does anyone have any uh, questions for clarification from Alderman Bander's proposal? Mr. Cannon, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess I would direct this to Barry. Um, if we were to pass, I mean, I, I think it's only polite that we push this forward to let the whole council vote on it. Um, I'm not, I was kind of in neutral on this, but I was recently on vacation down south, and the roosters, which I know are not included in this, started doing their thing about 2.30 in the morning. Every day I was there, so it was getting awakened at 2.30 in the morning by roosters was not fun. But that said, um, one of the questions I would ask you is if we move forward with this, <clears throat> It's inevitable there'll be some questions or concerns about this going forward. How would we manage those in-house? I, I, I won't speak for the police chief, but I'm guessing he wants nothing to do with this, is my opinion, but I don't know if that's true or not. I think it goes back into with bees. Um, any of those questions that come up, come back to me. Um, but I do go through the permits, so my assumption is once a ordinance is crafted, um, just like... A, City Attorney Jim McCall learned so much about bees and different kinds and everything else. I'm sure we're going to be educated on chickens and how many feet they have and what they walk like and everything else like that. Um, you know, Alderman Banger stated the chickens that he's looking at, the chicks cost $4 each. I'm sure that I'm going to find about the emperor chicken that costs about $16. Um, but at the same point in time, those questions really do get fielded through me when people have in I'm glad that we're not doing the roosters, and that was a big, big discussion last time because we used to have um, roosters in people's garages, and we had rooster fights and other things. So last time that we were talking about it, and the police department did um, go in there. And I think it also goes back into the ordinance, how you actually deal with the uh, chickens. Um, and there's all kinds of coops, and I will tell you that there's... Um, palace kind of coops and industrial coops and um, very small coops and that will also be part of the discussion that the city council will have to have with the city council because um, four chicks are not a lot but at the same point in time um, just like what we did with bees there would be a sign there would be making sure that your neighbors know what's going on um, but again that comes back down later. So long answer, but it would be filled back to me. Okay, thank you. Other uh, questions for clarification? Um, my question that um, when this write-up came out, <coughs> excuse me, if we're going to have chicken coops, do we get building department involved with permits? Mm -hmm. Is it pre? Uh, is it... You know the the question that was brought up to me was is it, it's a structure do you are you do you buy one that's already pre-made or if someone builds one is it considered like building a playhouse for your kids swing set so the answer to that is is it's probably going to be like bees which we did not have community development go out to go look at all the hives and all those um, and again that goes back into the ordinance what do you want to see and again from what I know and from what I've read in a lot of the newspapers, 
most of these are prefabbed already that people would be so you're not going to have someone um, buying two by fours and not saying it right but right. making chicken wire to make a uh, chicken coop but most of these are all set up that, they didn't know. that was just that was simply just brought up to me mr. Bandra I can assure you my only interest in eggs is buying them and having them for breakfast does anyone else have a point of clarification Question. Yes. Um, are we going to be looking at a minimum square footage for a lot so that we can have an idea of how close in proximity these chickens will be to their neighbors? So in the write-up, uh, Alderman Bandrud only talks about the five-foot setback, um, backyard setback for the coop. So he is recommending that in the draft if we brought that back. So, um, And again, with the beehives, we did have some parameters, but again... Um, a little bit different from a bee to a chick. Okay, well, this is, uh, we do have someone in on the signatory sh sheet. So, the council meeting is now going to be open to members of the audience for 20 minutes to address the city council on matters that are on the agenda only. We ask that persons wishing to address the city council keep their comments to five minutes in length. Comments must be addressed to the council as a whole through the mayor and profanity may not be used in any form. Um, Andre? Andrea. Andrea, I'm sorry. Andrea, help me with the last name. I should know that, but uh, thank you. Please come forward. Elin, want to tell the people in advance they can leave? Oh, did you want to leave the advance? You just leave. You don't have to stay. Oh, I'm interested in chicken. <laughs> 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 just come up here. Um, I'm so, sorry, the last name. Yeah, just speak into the mic, please. Okay, yeah, so I just wanted to come to support this venture. Um, I've had an interest in having chickens for a while now. Um, and I think they've grown in popularity all across the country. Um, and... For me, it would be to um, provide a more sustainable lifestyle, and um, I'm, I've been into gardening recently, and um, it would help to have me know where my food's coming from, and I really think that it could help set the city apart from other cities, cities in the area that are not allowing this. So that's all. Thank you for coming forward. <laughs> yes. That was the only signatory in for tonight's reading. This now brings us up to uh, discussion. Do we have any points of discussion on Mr. Banger's proposal? Mr. Gallo. I, I recall in elementary school, we used to raise ducks and we would watch them hatch. And then we had the opportunity to bring them home and then set them free eventually. But I never remembered my parents or any of my classmates' parents having to come to the city to clear whether or not we could have the duck come home. Um, so I'm just kind of curious to know what would the difference be now if we raised chicks at home and had them roam around our yard versus in elementary school when we got a duck to bring home. Um, I'm not sure who wants to, but my, my thought would be that ducks were usually just a project that you let go. This would be, my understanding, this would be a renewable source of food that would go on for years and years and years. Sure. So. My ducks never went away, unfortunately. So. You don't want to know what happened to your No, they stayed. <laughs> <laughs> they became pets. Yeah. So. I guess so. unless so, Mr. Banjo, would you like? I, no, I, actually, when I was a 4-H leader, we would uh, we would send ch chicks home with kids for a week at a time, uh, but then they went back to the the farm that they came from. Uh, so I I don't know of any that lingered, but it, it, one of the th things that's changed with backyard chickens lately is you know I guess just growing up on a farm we'd get our hundred chicks in the spring and you know, the 70 or 80 that li lived in the summer, uh, you know, we'd, we'd butcher. And so that's that's commercial uh, chicken raising. Chickens nowadays, uh, there's ornamental chickens, there's show chickens. People are getting into chickens a as family pets, which I guess the farm boy in me thinks that's kind of strange. But... Uh, there, there are there are tons of chicken enthusiasts out there who 
aren't necessarily in it for the eggs. And these chickens typically age out of egg laying over the course of 18 months for or 24 months. And then uh, on the farm, they become stew Boil. chickens. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but in the city, people keep them as pets, and they don't have that, that uh, you know, byproduct of eggs, which, to, to me, what's the point? But uh, to a lot of people, they are now pets. Um, and so... And so it, it it has changed a lot. I, I I guess I would ask kind of kind of think of it in those terms. Uh, it's it's not like having a farm animal uh, anymore. It's it's uh, some of these some of these silkies. If you're into chickens, uh, are are ornamental show chickens. And and yeah, the chicks aren't four dollars, uh, mayor. But for those, uh, they're a little more expensive. But yeah, this is kind of a low uh, dollar hobby for a lot of people. Um, if you if you're raising chickens to feed your family, you're you're you definitely probably are on a farm, um, but like I said, this is this is something I'd like to see advance out of committee so I could come back with with uh, an ordinance that we can uh, we can vote on uh, after getting feedback from residents in our wards. Thank you. Any other questions for clarification? So the only um, we all need four votes to make this go forward is that. Uh, do a straw vote on Mr. Banger's request to move this on to an ordinance before the council. Well, it would be an ordinance that would come back to a committee of the hall for discussion. Okay, for discuss. Well, I'm sorry. Most of my points are, I think, are kind of, unless Mr. McCall has any any legalisms that I need to add to it. I, th- I think I've laid it all out right here. So I have five points. I'm I will, not sure. I will, I will defer to Mr. McCall on this one. He is our parliamentarian. Uh, um, I think we could probably draft an ordinance Cause straight I don't, out. I mean, if you wanted to do that, I know that when we did bees, we brought it back because of some of the other things. And then I know city attorney uh, Jim McCall actually said one of those things which would be number six, which is not um, a resident would need to make sure that their title allows for this because, again, that was one of the concerns that certain... Well, yeah, that's, I mean, that's up to the individual property owner. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. that's a potential concern, but that's not a city concern. That's a neighbor concern. So we could probably put something together. Mm-hmm. We're... I was kind of fly by the seat of my pants on this one. You know, we have so many acronyms that I mean, food for thought. Would you, uh, you know, feel more comfortable if we brought it back to the committee as a whole, so that we had. Time. No, I'd, I'd rather just uh, draft it. I'd rather just yeah, I'd just rather draft it. Okay. Uh, if that's okay with everyone else. Yeah. All right. So straw vote to uh, move it forward for Mr. McCall and an ordinance. All in favor? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four. I'll be proud. Against? One, four, four, and one against. Mr. Banger, uh, you're on the road. All right, thank you. (laughs) Mr. Banger, could I ask, they probably wouldn't be ready for the farmer's market or the city market, right? No, no, probably not. If he does it on the farm, they might be ready. (laughs) Uh, Mr. uh, Crumstock, we're talking about Kirchhoff and the Owl vacant property. Thank you very much, Mayor and City Council. Before you is actually uh, two different discussions, but it deals with vacant property. Um, the first one that we're actually talking about is across the street. Um, we designated it as lot number two in the write-up, but it's actually uh, lot number four as we talk about it. It's the last one that was not completed with the uh, river walk um, overall plan development over there. but. And we were asked to bring back this property and the other vacant property that we'll be talking about <coughs> on Kirchhoff Road. But for folks who are, might be listening to this for the first time, um, you look at this lot, and based on the 2013 purchase price for the entire property of 954 750 but since that time, we've done um, four appraisals. Um, obviously, a municipality has to do appraisals, and it is in a TIF district. But in... 2009, it showed as $940,000. In 2010, it showed as $700,000. In 2011, 
In 2013, it showed as 425,000, and the newest appraisal that we actually have confirmed is of December 12th of 2017, which shows at $575,000. This is in the TIF district, so if the city council decides that you would like to sell the property, all proceeds from the uh, sale have to go back into the TIF. It cannot go to other funds or other uses. And obviously, this TIF does have a life still um, until about 2023 is when um, it actually expires. It is a negative TIF right now that the general fund is supporting in our CAFR. Um, but now that we're done um, with our bonds, and it does have the outlook that it will be positive on its own. But again, if we do sell the property, it does go back into the TIF. It just makes the TIF overall positive quicker. And then obviously when that uh, TIF is dissolved, <coughs> any proceeds that are left in that go <coughs> to di distribution to all the taxing bodies. I do bring that up because, again, um, when you do look at lot number two by the designation that we actually call lot number four, there's all kinds of utilities throughout that area. Um, obviously some stormwater and there's some water and some other pieces. It was to be a carbon copy of lot number one, which was um, realtor on the bottom and then uh, obviously some condos up on the top. So this is actually just giving you a little more feedback, but staff's comments and thoughts, um, do, does the city council want to keep this as green space? Um, that's really what it is right now. Um, I do appreciate the uh, residents, especially the one who has the dog who is really great with Frisbee. Um, he use, utilizes that as a dog park. Um, but we do have a lot of people who do use it. If the city council decides to sell the property, and again, it's approximately 1.07 acres, um, can we please use a professional firm? Um, I prefer that staff is not the one putting up the sign and actually starting to market it. Um, and then obviously, um, if you decide to um, want the property to be marketed, how would the city council want to market this? And this is actually a discussion that we would have with the Economic Development Committee is it just that, hey, anybody who knocks on our door, we're going to change any of zoning and some of the items, or is it specific that you want it to look like what the original plan, or are you looking for something specific? But we really do need to know how this property needs to be marketed. And then the final item for the city council to think about, um, if you do proceed with uh, marketing this, um, if you look at the corner, the main corner right by where the two sides of the sidewalk come together, you will see that the city has put up posts and we do advertise different community events from those posts. Um, it's actually very beneficial and I can tell you that um, people on Kirchhoff Road get those signs a little quicker than sometimes our electronic sign because it's a static sign. But staff would actually ask if we do market it, hopefully we can actually keep our posts there in that carve out section or whoever purchased it, maybe with having uh, understanding that those three posts are out there or maybe they make a community sign that we have something else that we could put on there. But those are the four discussion items that we have for this item. Um, obviously, you can see that the marketable um, point of the overall appraisals, it has gone down, but now it has started slowly coming back up. So with that, those are the items. Thank you, Mr. Comstock. Um, in regard to your fourth point, you're asking a portion of the corner where we have a signpost to be carved out. Um, where are you talking in regard to having the city put an easement in there? Would could either be, be an, it could oh. either be an easement or as we discuss with whoever the eventual owner is, that maybe they put up a community sign and then they have to advertise what we put out there or something. There are ways of getting around that, but we do believe the easement is the quickest, but depending on what happens with the property, there are other ways of communicating what we're trying to do. Thank you. Uh, questions for clarification? Mr. Budrat? The current costs for upkeep of the property, cutting grass, where, where do those fall? That's actually part of our landscaping overall for 
um, downtown and Kirchhoff and everything else. Um, so it's part of our weekly schedule, even with our seating and, and our um, overall landscaping, but it is part of our regular projects. So we don't carve it out per se. Hey, Mr. Cannon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, to answer your first question, Barry, in my opinion, it should not remain green space. Uh, I would like to see it put up for sale tomorrow if we could. Uh, I've been asking for that for a while. This, okay, good. Good. Um, obviously, I think we need to use a professional firm. There's no one on staff that should be in the real estate business. So I think, you know, going outside to get a professional to market it for us, I think is great. And, uh, you know, how it's marketed, I guess my opinion is if we can get someone to buy it, um, let them come to us with a proposal of what they want. I mean, I don't really have a specific thing. I doubt if we're going to get someone to build another building just like the ones that are there. But if that's what they want to do, that's I'm fine with that. So, I, again, I'd like to, you know, with the signpost thing, I guess we, I, I would ask that we just negotiate with the person who bought it as opposed to putting, I don't want that to be a stop thing where they say, okay, you guys are already taking part of the property away and I just haven't even bought it yet. I think I would just ask that we negotiate with, the, with a potential buyer to do it. I'm not against what you, what you want to do. I just don't think I want to put another caveat in there that might stop a well, possible sale. So, I mean, since we have a real estate person on staff here, I think maybe we could get some great direction as to what professional staff we should use to get this thing out there. But I would like to get rid of it as quickly as possible. Thanks. Uh, do we have, I guess we're going, we're going into discussion, so any further uh, discussion on the property? Mr. Banjo. Um, oh, what he said, and I would echo his uh, no strings attached uh, comment. Let's let's get this out there. Let's find out what the market dictate it wants to be when it grows up, and and get it off of our rolls. Thanks. Okay. Any further clarification? I mean, or any further discussion on the matter? Well, let's just call the uh, more questions. We are running a little short staffed here tonight. So, first question Does the council want the property to stay green? All those in favor of having it stay green? We have two. All those opposed? We're 2 2. Well, on that case, it stays the way it is at the moment. It stays the way it is. Uh, if the city council wants to sell the property, approximately 1.07 acres, uh, we ask for approval to utilize a professional firm. The TIF fund and any proceeds from an eventual sale can pay for this service. Uh, All in favor of moving forward with that, raise your hand. Mr. Mayor, no, how, how, can we, how can we ask we're that just, question if it's just a green space? Yeah, the green space oh, sorry, can't be both. Sorry. And, so I guess we're, we're so, done. Yeah, I guess that we're done unless it comes up. Yeah, so. Still me. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Cannon. I was just all of a sudden trying to figure out a way that we could uh, move forward with it. So we're done with uh, the Kirchhoff and Owl. And now we'll move on to Algonquin Road and vacant property. So um, now we're back to number two. Um, obviously, what you have before you is the vacant lot on Algonquin Road. Um, it's about 2400 West Algonquin Road. The city has owned this um, lot for a long time. It's right by the uh, closed bank um, on Algonquin Road. Um, obviously, you have the parameters in some of the other pieces that we talk about. Um, put it in a picture if you have not driven on Algonquin Road to see our green space there. Um, but in 2012, the appraisal for the 0.551 acres was valued at $250,000. A recent verbal um, appraisal that we received, and that was part of the discussion that City Attorney Jim McCall and I had with the appraisal, um, they feel that there's two parts of the appraisal. Um, it could still be $250,000, 
um, but they have a big caveat, and that deals with the electronic or the com ed lines that go by the property. They felt that whoever would purchase the property, um, if they could not get com ed to move the um, electronic, um, the com ed lines, it devalues the appraisal all the way down to about twenty-five thousand. I mean, forty-five thousand dollars. So, um, with the verbal that we had. The question really comes out to be, do you still want to sell this? And then, obviously, with this appraisal that we have, um, it's questionable what people could actually do with it. Um, originally, this was the discussed area that Fire Station 17 was going to be built on. Um, obviously, that did not happen. And, again, this is just um, vacant land. The city has never really had any big plans for the property. Um, it goes back into, from my understanding, uh, when the construction behind it was actually being done, there was discussed at one point a road that was sort of going to be in there, and that's why it was dedicated to the city, but that's a long time ago. So with that, it's pretty much the same four questions that we had in the last one. Does the city council want the property to stay green space? Um, does the city council Council want to sell the property, and again, it's 0 .551 um, acres. Um, it's the green space plus part of the parking lot that the city actually purchased back when we were talking about Fire Station 17. And then recently, uh, Keller Williams um, did contact me about when we were going to have this discussion, and obviously, I told them what it was, and I told them what the old appraisal was, and I don't know if he's still even at interest in the property but do i go back to him and um, say here's what the city's thinking about and then obviously the fourth question if the property is to be sold what does the city council want with the property to be marketed and do you really even care about this um, 0.551 acres that some people would just call a sliver thank you mr crumstock do we have any uh, questions of clarification on the property from the right up Mr. Budmans. Same question. Um, where's the maintenance fees being paid for from this one? It is actually um, part of the landscaping, but limited um, because they don't go there all the time. But it is part of our landscaper's contract. Okay. Mr. Cannon. So Barry, so, Barry, I've never heard at all about this problem with ComEd before. So it's kind of news to me. And I understand it's probably been there for a while. So when we bought this property, we must have known about this problem. We've known, well, let's put it in perspective. When we were thinking about constructing a fire station, ComEd was going to move the items either that we were going to pay for the uh, poles to be moved. Um, it was really the new appraisal when the appraiser was actually discussing it that he felt um, there's a burden to move that, um, and that's why he gave us two verbal comments that it's roughly 45 if they can't move it but if they can move it then it's still the two hundred and fifty thousand dollars so it's really their appraisal and appraiser um, who is making this decision but when we were talking fire stations and any other the past one was always comment can always move anything for a price but you're talking about a difference between forty five thousand and two fifty that is correct that's Mr. what we heard that's the difference in the appraisals with it uh, that we'd received. So you know, let's assume we got if ComEd didn't like us when we asked them to move it, would they charge us ten grand? 50 it would be grand? whoever purchased the property would actually make that request. It would not be a city request anywhere. Well, I guess from my perspective, I think assuming the numbers we're talking about here are correct, why wouldn't we want to get involved and have a move a post for two hundred and some thousand dollars? I mean that's crazy money and I mean and, I, and it's hard for me to understand how that property hasn't gone up a diamond value since we bought it well first of all we bought it back in 2007 or 2008 um, when, the, when the when the prices were were up there and they've done nothing but dive since then um, and that's that's why one of the other it, uh, it, one of the other characteristics of that property that property is pretty unique it's very narrow and very deep so there's not a lot you can do with it except build a fire station 
This is what the city thought. But then we found several out we years ago. But then we found out we couldn't do that either. Well, it wasn't you couldn't do it. You didn't want to do it. Yeah. So, um, that, but that's the position we're in right now. So I guess you know, from where I'm standing, you know, we don't need more green space down there. It's not the way it's set up. It's not really. It doesn't really have a function other than it just sitting there. So I guess I would like to see it marketed. I would ask us as a city to look into getting ComEd to move the pole since we're talking about $200,000 plus. Um, and, you know, how, how it gets marketed, I guess it's like the piece across the street to what I said earlier is, you know, um, let's see if, you know, I think a small franchise could fit on there if that would be appealing to someone. I, I don't think we should be here deciding how and who could move in there before we even get anybody even interested in it. I'd like to see it open up. I know I'm, I've been told off record that the bank was actually marketing this as part of their property for a while, so I don't know if the banks had any feelers at all. Um, I don't know where that's at, if they have any interest in trying to co-marketing with us. I, I'm not really sure, but I think there's some options we have out there. I'd like to see us pursue some of those, but move quickly and move it, get it on the market. Oh, Mr. McCall, uh, I, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I will say that I did send a letter to the bank um, about a year ago or so, because it came to light that that, that 20 foot strip that we actually purchased from the bank, the bank then sold to Byline Bank, which now thinks it still owns that 20 feet. So I sent them a letter saying, you don't own that 20 feet. So did they ever respond to you? That they no, they have it? not. But uh, be that as it may, they don't own that 20 feet. So when you say they're, they're marking part of that. Oh, I thought they were marking the whole parcel. Uh, no, no. <laughs> Okay. But 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 they are marketing or they were marketing, that but the goes. parcel they included our twenty feet. Okay. So. All right. Thank you. Sure. Any other uh, questions for clarification or discussion, Mr. Bandrew? Thank you. Um, but the same thing as the last parcel. I I I vote we unload it as quickly as possible, I, and I think we should pursue aggressively the bank angle because it, because I I think it would depending on. Uh, who might purchase that and may, maybe trash the existing building and and big, build something bigger there? They might be interested in this small strip, and maybe we could make them a deal. So, I, I bottom line is let's get rid of it, in my opinion. Um, but if, if there's if there's an an yeah. angle with that bank property, let's pursue that. Any other discussion? Yes. Thank you. Um, may I ask the city attorney a question? I, I agree with Alderman Banjer that if we get that marketed and maybe someone would want to buy the bank and that one too, mm -hmm. even though the bank is asking way too much. But um, if the bank sells, though, that's going to show up on title that our, they've got. Yes, it will. Yeah, so that's going to cause a problem with their title and yes, could be a will. dispute, could de delay things too. Yes, it will. So I thought, okay, just wanted to sure. make sure I was right on that. Thanks. You're absolutely correct. So, so, is it, so my question is, is there any, Mr. McCall, what can we do to make this an easy? I mean, is there something we should do before we even move, attempt to move forward with this to make it easier? Because Alderman Majakis brings up a good point. Well, I mean, we. we We've alerted the bank that they don't own that, that property. There's nothing more I can do about it. They just simply don't own it. Um, and that property's been on the market for a long time. And I'm not a real estate person, but, I mean, it, it's got a big tag on it. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. um, so. Well, and, really and if I, tricks. and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not so much if we sell our lot, we're fine because we owe that. It's if the bank sells theirs prior to us, that's where the hiccup with the title will come because they're going to, it's going to show on their title that that's our property and they think it's theirs and that's where the hiccup comes. So um, if ours sells first, we're fine. But if we have these hopes of trying to sell the bank, there, someone wants to come in and buy the bank and that one, there could be a little hiccup with the, with title. Well, if they came in and they wanted to buy both parcels, the bank and ours, mm -hmm. that would immediately be straightened out as to who owns what. Even. But they're buying the entire parcel being the, the bank and our parcel. Do you think, though, that the bank would try and be that their value is higher taking property from us? See what I'm saying? 
Did, would what, that become an issue? Like the, the what is it, twenty five feet? Twenty feet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the twenty. Yes, but the twenty feet. It. I know, but being that the bank says they, it's theirs. I'm just saying, do you see that being a negotiating problem? Of any from time? the bank. Yeah. Yeah. But and that, would, that wouldn't affect us. Okay. And I would make the uh, comment that I had um, Public Works actually spray paint on the uh, concrete <coughs> just to uh, show the distribution. Well, that's good. Okay. Thank you. For Mr. Alderman Cannon, please. Uh, Barry, can you guys just, um, you know, I've read this a couple of times. I, I was a little bit confused. So how much money do we actually have in this property? So we bought the one piece for 250 And then how much do we pay for the original piece? It was actually deeded to us, as far as I know, um, for this future road that never was produced. If I, if I may, right, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Mr. McCall, go for it. When 20 years ago or whenever it was, Kimball Hill put in that development on Algonquin Road, and when they originally laid it out, there was this small strip of, of land that came off the development and, and went north up to Algonquin Road, if I'm, if I'm making that clear. Sure. And about three quarters of the way through it, Kimball Hill said, we, we don't want it. And so the city ended up with it, and that's how we got it. So we didn't pay anything for that hard parcel? No. So we just paid 250 for the extra piece? They, they just carved that out as part of the McGlaris property and said, we don't want this, you keep it. That's what happened. Okay. That's Thanks how we got the, it. Thanks for the explanation. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Any further uh, discussion? Well, to call the first question, does the city council want the property to stay green space? Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Okay. Well, it's not staying green space. Number two, uh, the city council wants to sell the property and ask the staff to approve uh, to utilize a professional firm. All in favor? That's unanimous. And then finally, if the property is to be sold, what does the city council want the property to be marketed as, or do you care? So the, I guess the question is, does it? Yes, Mr. I'm Jack. sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. It, it's a C1 now? Yes, C2. C2, okay. So in other words, I guess the question would be, if the property is to be sold, does the city council care what it is to be marketed? So I'll straw vote for it to move over. Do you care? Does anyone care what it needs to be? I care. I mean, uh, I think we should have a more proactive approach as to what we're doing with our space in our town. I mean, we should use okay. these as lessons, both this property on the other side of Kirchhoff and that property. Okay. I, I care. So, and those who do not care, raise your hand. Yes. <laughs> okay. I care and I don't care. Okay. But it's not that I don't care, but it's such a weird lot of land that I don't think right. these crazy things are going to come to it. So, so I don't care. <laughs> well, let me ask a Go clarification. Ahead. Clarification. Um, Wait, we're, obviously, we're still on. Um, I've heard some stuff tonight. So, obviously, with the city attorney over here. So I guess that we should go back to the uh, bank slash um, marketing that area first to see if they're interested in buying it first from us. And then after that, yes. mm -hmm. go back to the Keller Williams individual who um, contacted me and then I told him what the appraisal was and he didn't come back. And then the third part would be going to the full marketing of the property and whatever the vote ends up. So, so in other words, you should probably come back to us after this is done. Well, or what's going to happen is that the city attorney is going to approach the bank and approach who's selling it. Um, we'll get you a staff report if we get a bite on it. If not, then we would be back. Hey, Barry, do you, just out of curiosity, excuse sorry, me, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Cannon. Do you have any, do you have any direct contacts with Byline Bank? Um, it's been a long time, and no, uh, the people who I used to communicate and deal with, they're all gone. Because, you know, I know for a fact that they just made a major acquisition just recently. Mm -hmm. It was and in some, the newspaper. And some of their branches are up this way, so maybe if they got the other piece of land, maybe they might reconsider. I know down on the south side, they have a couple of really nice new buildings that they've built. Maybe that would be attractive for them to build a new building right there, possibly. I'm not saying they would, but I'm just... But I think it goes back into the communication first to the bank to let them know 
and see if we get a bite at that. But point. you need, but I mean, and I have nothing against Mr. McCall contact them, but you need to go to a different level besides mm -hmm. lawyers mm -hmm. because they they do they handle all kinds of great work. But I mean, if yeah. they're looking, you need to get a hold of a marketing vice president or something. Right, like that and like I said, the things. contacts that I had, they're all gone from the bank. Okay, thank you. So, actually, that vote didn't go anywhere. So, um, we're so our our uh, we're going to move forward with Mr. McCall. First. First, and then you're going to have a staff report, and we'll bring this back to, is that the plan of attack, Mr. McCall? Yes, actually, I can I can investigate who to contact at Byline Bank. Great. I mean, your, your point's well taken, uh, and see if there's any movement there. Okay. I believe we're, we're done, Mr. Comstock. Yep. And I guess this is an intro for... A fun-filled, action-packed bidding and proposals, change orders, construction, and contract management. If you didn't have enough up to tonight with chickens and uh, property, and now we are to uh, bidding versus proposals, bring RFPs, slash everything, um, we have a whole bunch of individuals who are going to be participating in this discussion. So obviously with that, I'll have uh, Public Works Director Fred Vogt start off. And again, there is a PowerPoint that was provided to you too. And for residents, we hope that you enjoy this uh, information. And uh, Fred, this is quite a roadshow you have assembled. I have just a team to um, put this roadshow on. Um, I'm just going to do the introduction here. And uh, because we've had a number of projects and uh, equipment purchases that were proposed over the last several months, um, with questions that came up in regards to our procedures for when do we bid projects, when do we do proposals, when do we seek uh, statements of qualification, professional services, uh, what are our thresholds in terms of uh, bidding proposals. We have all of that, but uh, it's been, I believe, a number of years since we've really stepped back a bit and um, caught our breath and said, okay, well, let's make sure that everybody's on the same page with understanding of uh, what the city does, what the uh, purchasing procedures are, why we sometimes look for waiver of bids um, and the like, how we go about our construction project management with regards to um, authorizations in the field, change orders, when we see change orders, when we don't see change orders. Um, we have had our public works staff as well as our city engineer spend the last um, couple of weeks assembling the presentation that you're going to see so that we can uh, be as all-encompassing as we believe that we need to be and can be so that uh, um, there's a better understanding. Hopefully you can, uh, you know, if you want to keep the materials that we have here in the packet tonight for future reference, we're always, with every project, every uh, proposed purchase, uh, more than happy to answer questions about um, why we're doing or why we're proposing to do things the, the way we are, but uh, to kind of have a resource guide and uh, go over this. It may be something that uh, every few years or several years uh, wouldn't hurt to just go over and if there's updates or if there's things during the course of time that council wants to see differently that uh, we um, kind of inventory that and um, keep track of that so everyone's on the same page so with that uh, for the PowerPoint presentation I'll turn it over to Rob Horn first and uh, Ryan Lindemann from Christopher Burke is uh, also here for part of the presentation thank you Fred Mayor City Council. Um, I'll go through this um, as quickly as I can. I know it's been a little bit of a long evening. Um, okay, so I'll make sure I understand the buttons. Um, we tried to prepare the presentation in a similar format as the memo, so kind of follow some sort of um, consistent pattern. Um, the first item is public lighting or bidding. Um, uh, these projects are usually um, more substantial project. Sorry, <laughs> I like to move around. Uh, more substantial construction projects, more substantial uh, equipment purchases, or major service contracts, all of which are usually proposed or are assumed to um, exceed twenty thousand dollars in cost. Uh, examples of these projects would be uh, major stream, uh, stream bank stabilization, storm sewer projects, major road construction, um, significant uh, land, um, landscape uh, service contracts, things like that. 
or standardized uh, vehicle and equipment purchases. Um, the $20,000 threshold uh, was established uh, about a decade ago by the City Council um, uh, during some uh, changes that were consistent throughout the Northwest Municipal Conference um, from 10000 to 20000 Excuse me. Um, uh, some other projects that I think are important for the City Council to be aware of are publicly let projects that we don't actually publicly let at the City. Um, there are municipal partnering initiatives that we take advantage of. There are federal, local, and state <coughs> purchasing co-ops that we take advantage of, all of which are publicly let um, projects. Um, we do that to um, uh, take advantage of uh, savings and manpower. Um, and uh, take advantage of economies of scale. Um, for example, uh, the pipelining, crack sealing, and curb replacement projects. Sorry. <laughs> uh, the pipelining, crack sealing, and sidewalk curb and replacement uh, programs that we initially or recently um, started participating with the Municipal Partnering Initiative, I think we've recognized savings upwards of $100,000 as part of that initiative. Um, um, I didn't mention this, but if you have questions as we go, please feel free to interrupt. Uh, the next item would be proposals. Uh, these are proposals, same types of projects, just um, have a value under 20000 that's proposed. Um, projects uh, like this would uh, be examples of small drainage improvements, st small storm sewer improvements, specialized um, uh, service contracts, or what I call them as relational or specialized service contracts, uh, in that they're very complex uh, bid documents to try to put together because they are, have very unique circumstances to those and they're very unique to um, this specific municipality so they can't really be partnered on um, and again small standardized equipment things that don't require a lot of specialized um, 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 detail to the specifications or the equipment uh, again uh, the ten thousand dollars threshold um, was established about a decade ago at the same time as the bidding um, for um, uh, all proposals uh, over $10,000 do come to City Council for approval um, before they're uh, awarded. <clears throat> I did want to show the City Council this because this is really what has come up in, in previous discussions as, as a concern and, and rightly so. Um, these are examples of purchases that we don't bid out um, that we seek proposals on that are over $20,000. Um, the primary reason for those few examples are related to um, uh, the complex uh, bid specifications that would be required, uh, lack of knowledge by staff to be able to put together a, a bid specification for an item such as a sign printer, um, uh, sign truck body, uh, that was a very unique purchase. It had to be customized. There are only two vendors in our area that even do that type of work. So um, those are the, the, the proposals we received. And again, janitorial services. I, in my previous life, did a, 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 tried to establish some bid specifications on janitorial services. Nearly impossible. Um, it really is a proposal style contract that you have to meet people on site, talk them through what your expectations are, and uh, to get um, that type of um, proposal. Um, just some examples of uh, items where we brought to the City Council with less than three proposals and, and ex a brief explanation as to why um, fuel is a big one. Um, leak detection, uh, the well repair, specialized truck bodies. These are all examples of uh, items that we are either in a situation where there's limited sources or limited amount of bidding opportunities, limited vendors that can provide that service. Um, there's a technology uh, proprietary issue with what they provide to the city specifically. Um, there's familiarity with the city's infrastructure. That's one of the big 
issues we run into is if a, if a vendor um, that has worked with us for many years has a unique understanding of our infrastructure, even if we put out the proposals, they can so clearly underbid any other vendor that it it's a mute point to do that. So um, those are examples, about half a dozen, that we do annually. Um, any questions before I move on to design services? Uh, design professional services, there's been a lot of conversation recently about bidding engineering services and I just want for the council's benefit I want to clarify that um, state law does not allow um, or, or has regulations uh, related to how you select a design professional that would be an architect, an architect an engineer or a land surveyor specifically spelled out in um, their regulations uh, you're not um, um, you're uh, required to look at their qualifications, not their proposal. As a matter of fact, and if you look at the last sentence, it said price quotations are not a consideration in the selection process. So um, I just prepared a few um, pages on the QBS process, which is what city staff utilizes when selecting a design professional for a significant engineering project. Um, we've used this process on three projects since 2016. We have it being utilized in two projects now. One is a water main project. The other one is a comprehensive plan that we're currently going through. Um, uh, there's the, it's a seven step process in which we invite um, or solicit engineering services from no less than three engineering firms. Uh, the most recent one we did, we seeked uh, qualifications from seven. Um, each uh, proposal is reviewed by an individual staff member, um, no less than three, uh, usually more than three staff members. Scores are compiled. Um, a listing, a rating is, is uh, uh, um, established, and then we hold interviews with engineers or design professionals. Uh, following those interviews, we negotiate um, uh, a proposal with the most qualified um, design professional. Um, excuse me. Lastly, just as a point of reference, I just threw this in there so the city council understood. Um, these are the number of different engineering firms we have worked with on projects since the beginning of 2017. So there are a lot of different engineering firms that we utilize this process with to select the appropriate engineer for the appropriate project. Um, that is the end of my presentation. Um, if there are no questions, I can introduce Ryan Lindemann, oh. Alderman Cannon. Well, I have one. Oh. Uh, any questions, clarifications? Sure. sure. So I'm a little bit confused by that last statement that you made about we're not allowed to ask about pricing. So if you, so if you ask for qualifications for competing firms, what if they both, what if all three of them come back and say they're all qualified to do the work? So what, what is the qualifying answer then? Yeah, it's not that you're not allowed to ask for pricing, but during the review of the qualified firms, you don't base your selection on the pricing. Once you've rated the firms and you have the interviews, at the interview process, you can ask for proposals at that time because you've narrowed the field down to three qualified design professionals to do the service. The idea is, the primary reason is you don't, um, as somebody said, you wouldn't bid out someone who's going to do surgery on you. You don't want to just offer the engineering services to the cheapest guy in the block because you get exactly what you pay for. Um, so I, I think the issue is the proposal absolutely comes into, into play, but not until you've narrowed the field down to the people you're seriously considering. So if we if we were in the position where we had you you and Fred or whoever else in your departments come up yeah. came, came to the city council and said here's the three firms that we've chosen correct you're going to make a recommendation based on what then 
by that time we will have negotiated with the appropriate firm and would have compared their proposal to the other proposals along with explaining our review process. So for example, we're doing one for the Arbor Drive water main replacement project right now. We're in the process of setting up interviews next week with three engineering firms. Those um, proposals were reviewed by three, uh, four members of staff. Um, we are compiling that information. We selected based on scoring, individual scoring, um, the three top candidates, when we invite them to the interview, we will ask them to bring a proposal for design services and a proposal for construction observation services. Once we, we don't want to consider that initially in the process. Okay, thanks for the answers. Yeah. So, uh, and, Mr. And, Bolt, do you and if I could just kind of expand on that a bit, when we look at qualifications, we look at experience, we look at our experience if we've used the firm, we look at the people that they are proposing to assign to the project, and when we do get to the point of looking at their proposal, the hours that they assign to various tasks, whether it be design services, the construction, observation, um, project coordination, are all considerations. Sometimes we see that two firms are really equal in our mind in terms of their abilities, but one is assigned 200 more hours to the project and then has a higher cost. We'll talk to them about, well, why is that? Because maybe they have good points, maybe they don't. But those are all considerations that uh, we take, factors that we look at uh, when trying to determine who's the best for a job. Mr. Crumstock. And just to answer your question, so when we go through the RFQ, then um, narrowing it down and then getting down, the final proposal that you're seeing is the one that we feel comfortable with. So we've already taken from big picture down to little picture. That's why you don't see all the other pieces that we've gone through. Okay, thanks. Any other questions before we, for Mr. Rob? Okay, and your next introduction is? Uh, Ryan Lindemann, uh, he's an engineer for Christopher Burke Engineering. Um, we work very closely with him on most of the capital projects uh, that we are involved with, with, with the city engineer. And I also do want to reiterate, if you're on any of our street program projects, you will see Ryan. He is typically um, Burke Engineering eyes on our projects. So usually he's not in a suit and tie. So it's really nice to see him uh, kind of dressed up. And congratulations on your new baby girl. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, council members, Mr. Mayor, thank you for the opportunity to present. Uh, Mr. Um, Lindman, could you step up the mic or move the mic closer, whatever. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity, council members and Mr. Mayor. The opportunity uh, tonight, the presentation is to increase the understanding of uh, change orders, um, which is uh, an aspect of construction projects uh, that we frequ frequently deal with. Um, there's two main types, contract adjustments and change orders, and then within change orders, there's two subsets of that, agreed unit pricing and force account. Uh, the image on the slide is uh, meant to illustrate how common and potentially costly change orders can be, um, with the dinghy being the original contract and the the yacht being named change order. I thought we bought a boat. <laughs> so we'll start first with contract adjustments. Uh, a contract adjustment, the definition would be an adjustment to the awarded contract line item quantities that adds to or deducts from the awarded contract cost. Um, I can run through some examples of, of a contract adjustment. A theoretical example would be a pavement marking contract where you have five or six different line items for different types of striping um, with a round figure for the length of the different types of striping. And when the contract is completed, those final numbers will be tabulated against what the awarded contract quantities were. Um, the final contract value will be adjusted to those final quantities. Um, the next example is a real life example from Squibb Avenue Extension this past year. Um, namely, the subgrade stability line items. Um, these are estimated um, when we put the plans together. Um, and this is estimated based on the drainage patterns in the area, the failure type of the existing pavement, um, any soil borings or pavement cores that we do. Um, but in the end, these are all estimates. Um, when you do 
excavate the road, the underlying conditions sometimes can be worse or better than what you expect. Um, so the line items that are used to estimate these quantities, once the final quantity is used, it's depend on the conditions encountered in the field and the extent of the, re the remediation as directed by the engineer. Um, and of course, public works staff is involved in assessing the remediation extents um, with an eye on the budget. The last example of this would be Arlingdale Drive reconstruction, also from last year. Uh, the adjustment for this was we went to bid and the bid prices came back so good and low that we were able to adjust the contract to add quantity um, to increase the limits of the scope of the project. We were able to increase or to improve a section of Highland Avenue. The image in the slide is the green section. So the originally awarded contract included the orange section. Um, the adjusted contract, due to favorable bid pricing, included the green section of Highland. Uh, next we'll be talking about change orders. Um, the first type being an agreed unit price. Uh, this is work outside the original awarded contract scope that is added in order to address differing site conditions, design changes, or changes to specifications or special provisions. The line items are quantified by the city or the engineer, and unit prices submitted by the contractor are reviewed prior to approval and commencement of the work. Um, a theoretical example of this would be a proposal for a storm sewer improvement project calls to reconstruct a manhole, um, but upon getting into doing the work and exposing this manhole, you see that it has failed, it's collapsing, it's in disrepair, and the best course of action is to actually remove the manhole and replace it. However, the original contract does not have line items for removing the manhole and replacing it. In this case, you would get a price from the contractor for these line items. The city would review and decide to reject or approve the price to perform the work. Um, a real life example of an AUP would be Squibb Avenue, Squibb Avenue Extension water main. In this case, AUP pricing was um, requested of the contractor to revise the proposed water main from an 8 inch diameter to a 12 inch diameter. The AUP prices reflect the increase in costs to the contractor of workmanship the material, everything associated with those line items. The next subset of change orders is a force account or time and materials. That's what TNM stands for. The definition of this would be when unit prices cannot be agreed upon, the time spent by the contractor's labor and equipment forces and the amount of materials used completing the work are documented and invoiced following IDOT construction memorandum policy and guidelines. Um, a theoretical example of this would be a water main project or an improvement project storm sewer, any underground project where we excavate and observe that there is an existing water main that has a T that feeds an abandoned water main. In this instance, it's not desirable to have a T, a cap T on an abandoned water main because it just um, can lead to future leaks or um, problems within the water main uh, for which the city is maintaining. Um, in this case, the contractor's there, it's exposed. Um, we would notify the city, let them know the situation, um, and tell the contractor to proceed on a force account. Um, they're there. We would track the equipment, the material, and the labor that they use to complete that task, if the city so desired. Um, a real life example of this was also from Squibb, Ave Squibb Avenue this past year um, at the intersection of Apollo and Squibb. There was a storm sewer, a proposed storm sewer manhole that was going to be installed at a blind connection. However, upon exposing the subgrade, uh, excavating for this manhole, it was observed that at this blind connection, it was impossible to fit the uh, precast manhole. And as such, we had to relocate, we had to excavate 
eight feet further to the west. By the way, this is the image that you see in the, in the picture here. The left side of that image is the blind connection um, that we could not place the manhole directly over it, so it had to be moved. The time and materials required to excavate the additional hole and backfill the original proposed location was tracked on a force count basis. All right, the uh, next portion of the presentation will be um, construction engineering and project management. Um, start with bid opening and tabulation. Uh, bid openings ensure the bidder qualifications and bonding requirements are met. Uh, verify the accuracy of each bidder's unit price, quantity, and cost calculations. Tabulate bids of all qualified bidders, establishing a low bid contractor. Next, we would move into the contract award recommendation, where we review the contractor's affidavit of, of availability, which is included in their proposal. Uh, the affidavit of availability um, indicates the contractor's volume of work already awarded and the low bid pending award at the time of the bid opening. This helps us assess their the, the, the volume of work that they have and whether they can accomplish our project uh, in a timely fashion. Uh, we can also check contractor's references at this point in time um, and provide a recommendation, recommendation for award to the city. Once awarded, we would schedule a pre-construction meeting. At this meeting, we would communicate the city's expectations with the contractor, obtain 24-hour emergency contact information from the contractor and all subcontractors, determine start date and establish progress meeting times and locations, uh, and discuss any special project considerations. It's important to note that this, these pre-construction meetings usually take place at Rolling, Public, uh, Rolling Meadows Public Works uh, with the director and staff um, that will be involved in this specific project, whether it be underground utilities or street superintendent, um, stuff like that. Another aspect of project management and construction engineering is utility coordination. This slide is meant to illustrate how complex this process can be before it even gets to the construction phase. Um, there are, very, there are uh, very many stakeholders in this process. Privately owned public utility locations are not part of contract documents. Um, requires extensive coordination with, with utility companies and oftentimes they're subcontractors. Um, and this can significantly affect project schedule and costs. Um, in some cases, contractors are shut down because of a delay in having a utility relocated, and at times that can incur remobilization costs uh, in extreme cases. It's important to note here that utilities and easements require payment by the mun municipality outside of the awarded contract. In other words, this is not accounted for in the awarded contract. It's separate with the utility contractors. Um, the cost of these reloc relocation efforts can sometimes be reduced through coordination efforts with the construction engineer on site. Um, Squibb Avenue Extension and NICOR are, is an example of this. There was a relocation with NICOR that original estimates put at 70000 for the relocation, but through coordination with NICOR and the engineer and the city, those prices have been significantly reduced. I don't believe we have a, a cost at this time, but um, indications are that they've been drastically reduced by more than half. Continuing on with utility coordination, this is Squibb Avenue. This is the north Northwest corner of Squibb Avenue and Apollo Drive, showing the Comet transformer in the lower left-hand corner there, along with NICOR gas lines and various telecommunication utilities buried within the footprint of the proposed roadway. The upper right image shows the relocated transformer and some shallow NICOR utilities that remained after the initial relocation. Um, in this case, the contractor was delayed until NICOR was able to relocate or to lower those lines. <clears throat> uh, 
More utility coordination. This is the Rolling Meadows Public Library where the Salt Creek, Salt Creek bike path terminates. Uh, these are before and after images showing the overhead utility lines and the utility pole. The image to the lower left shows um, a ComEd pole chopped in half. The intent of this illustration is to show you that multiple times, or commonly, utility poles will have multiple utilities on the same pole. Um, this requires much coordination with different utilities that share the same pole. As the as ComEd relocates their lines to a different pole, they chop off the pole above to the lowest point of the next um, service that's provided on that pole. In this case, it was AT&T. Then AT&T's crews come in, they have to relocate their line off the pole. Once it's all finished, the original owner of the pole, ComEd, comes in and removes that pole. So it's a complex process, <coughs> excuse me, complex process that can take significant coordination and time and can affect the project. Now I move on to another aspect of project management and construction engineering. Uh, material testing, quality assurance, uh, scheduling. Uh, this is where various types of materials require extensive in, in on-site testing, concrete compressive strength, asphalt compaction and de density, aggregate gradation testing, subgrade stability, mixed design verification, you go on and on. Um, the frequency of these testing is follow, we follow IDOT procedures uh, and guidelines for the frequency. Um, and this is also meant, QA services are also meant as a backstop to compare results with QC material testing, which is on the, on the contractor's responsibility, included in their contract. Um, another phase of construction engineering and project management is resident and business notification. These notifications are usually coordinated with uh, public works staff. Um, these are usually generated with direct knowledge and direction of the public works staff, and this helps in making sure that the staff is aware when residents call or when residents have concern that they're on the same page with the engineering and the contractor, that everyone, everyone is aware of what notifications have been sent out and what those notifications state. Uh, they'll include start dates, upcoming schedule, project milestones, um, any access, access restrictions, uh, utility service disruptions such as water main shutdowns, uh, and any special needs requirements. For example, any residents that have upcoming doctor's appointments or need wheelchair access or things like that. The city is very good about being out front and communicating with the engineer um, at the time. Construction observation inspection is the main day-to-day -day task um, that encompasses all of the other things that I've been talking about. Um, observation inspection will include a project daily diary, um, keep track of hours on site, weather conditions, labor and equipment forces, any significant material deliveries, visitors, traffic control and erosion control inspection notes, etc. We're also there full-time on site to ensure materials and workmanship are in conformance with contract specifications. The work that is performed will be measured and documented. Um, we'll keep as-built record drawings. These are meant to illustrate any deviations from proposed plan, especially useful for underground utilities because once it's covered up, you can't see it anymore. Those as-built record drawings can help um, uh, no, looking at the plans where something deviated or, or if they followed the plans, there would be no change. Um, material documentation, verify producer and source of materials. Uh, in place measurements are usually by line item. Another aspect is change orders. We went through this earlier. Hopefully you're all experts. Um, and then invoicing and pay estimates. Uh, usually once per month, contractors will submit pay for payment invoicing of, of quantities. Um, we will review those invoices and the corresponding submittals that are with those, waivers of lien and certified payroll, um, and issue a cover letter recommending payment if, upon review, those quantities match with our documentation. 
um, on the Squib Avenue extension, there was an issue where the invoice quantities did not match with what, what the documentation and measurements that we had. Um, we were able to resolve these discrepancies, um, saving the city approximately $24,000. Um, this was because our supporting document, documentation substantiated the city's position that the contractor's quantities exceeded the amount that it was actually performed. Full-time on-site construction engineering protects the city from overpaying for this work. Finally, we get to the last phase of project management and construction engineering, project closeout procedures. Um, we'll do a punch list inspection. Um, public Works staff departments are included in this walkthrough. Um, the image on the slide shows a storm sewer manhole grate in a curb and gutter on Arlingdale Drive. Uh, it was observed that the frame was cracked um, due to some faulty work by a subcontractor. Um, you can see from the image that the road, this inspection took place before the road was paved. We will do, some of these punch list inspections are interim inspections. They don't always necessarily take place at the end of the project. There'll be milestone inspections where they can, they cannot move on to paving, for example, until subgrade and concrete work is finished. This is an example of that. Um, also, there are some inspections that take place well after a project is finished. For example, period of establishment acceptance for landscape items. This will be turf grass or plantings that require a period of establishment, usually the following spring around the middle of May. In this case, we may be in July <laughs> with the weather we've been having. Um, then there's a bunch of closeout documentation submittals. Um, these vary depending on the funding type of the project, motor fuel tax, federal aid, community development block grant, IEPA, MWRD, Army Corps of Engineer. Um, they're all different types of final closeout documentation required for those, which we take care of. Um, and then final payment, releasing retention once all punch list and landscape establishment criteria are met. So uh, that's the end of my Presentation. Thank you for your time. Um, Any questions? Um, Brent, anything else you'd wish to add or before we go to questions? Just in summary, um, one the things that we've heard in some of the recent discussions and questions from council members is to provide more timely reporting on change orders, on um, project statuses. One of the things we intend to do this year with the 2018 street program, with water main projects, some of the major um, construction and improvements capital projects is to do that um, either via a monthly report um, included within our Friday letters, um, tie it in with our payment requests, which you'll see on the warrants from time to time. Typically our larger contracts make monthly payment requests. So um, you've heard a lot of the complexities about this. Um, fortunately, there aren't a lot of projects, Squibb Avenue being one that was uniquely complex in that it was not only uh, building a new road through a field, but uh, rebuilding an existing road that was built 40 some years ago that had uh, just a myriad of different utility easements and heights and uh, it, it was really amazing how they, how that road was built, how all the utilities were assembled out there in the 70s, kind of one by one, and nothing was coordinated at all. So hopefully that's not something we will deal with on a regular basis, but uh, there are a number of factors and things that we have to consider as we're doing construction projects that need decisions made in a relatively timely manner, whether that's back to public work staff as it typically is in consulting with the engineer. Be assured that we are watching these projects closely, we're documenting things and we're attempting in all cases to do what's best for the city in terms of not only the cost, but uh, the long-term maintenance and operation of those roadways and uh, utilities. So we'll work on this. Um, certainly welcome any feedback uh, as we go through the summer in terms of uh, our uh, reporting efforts to you. So that's kind of the wrap up that I would have for you at this point, unless there's any other questions or materials to discuss. Then that's our next. Any questions, clarifications, discussion? 
No further discussion. Thank you, Fred. It was okay. great. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are done. <laughs>